Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and you're watching a show where we will try and help deconstruct and demystify a term that some of you might have heard in the markets. You've heard of coffee can investing. You've heard of sip by sip investing in mutual funds. But have you heard about a cockroach portfolio, a cockroach portfolio investment strategy? If that surprises you, let me confess that I was also among those who recently read about it. And joining me on the show today is noted market expert Anand Tandon to help us understand and deconstruct and demystify this cockroach portfolio. Welcome to the show, Anand. It's been a, a bit of a rough time for uh, investors in the recent past in the Indian market. We saw a correction on account of factors and events that were not considered possible uh, just as when they happened. But given that backdrop, uh, the first question to you on the show today, uh, explain cockroach portfolio because unusual name, uh, a name that may not uh, go well with the idea of creating sustainable wealth. Uh, but what really is it, Anand? Thank you for having me. Uh, as you note, uh, you know, the word cockroach tends to uh, be a little repulsive. But the cockroach has a very interesting property. It is probably the only creature which will likely last a nuclear attack. So the word comes from there that, you know, what happens when the market is so volatile that you are unable to make predictions and you therefore cannot position yourself in terms of a scenario. Uh, remember that any asset allocation we do essentially assumes a certain scenario. What if you don't have a scenario in mind or you cannot predict one with any degree of, re of uh, certainty? You would then need to have an all-weather portfolio, a portfolio which basically doesn't take a call on where the market goes and is able to survive high degrees of volatility. So that's where the name comes from. And the scenario, that this, uh, this thing came about in the 70s in the US where, uh, uh, you know, we had a situation where we, have, we had an oil shock and very high interest rates. And as a consequence, because of the inflation going up, the Fed had to ha allow very high interest rates and the economy was uh, still was moving down. So you had a strange situation where you had high inflation at the same time, a depressed economy. And at, that was the time when it became a little interesting because Normally, when you are looking at asset allocation, by and large, we tend to have 60-40 as the basis on which most people build their portfolios, 60% uh, equity, 40% debt, and so on. The challenge here is that this automatically assumes that the market is growing and inflation is kind of under control because, you know, when the inflation is high or interest rates are high, bonds won't do well. But if interest rates are uh, uh, moving up but are, are low, uh, you know, you would have a situation with growth plus uh, low inflation is, uh, you know, is a great place for stocks to go up and so on. So a 60-40 portfolio is the usual benchmark, but it does not take into account scenarios in the market where there is stagflation or where there is, uh, you know, a situation where the markets are not growing or the economy is not growing and yet you have sustained high interest rates. So there was a, a, a you know, an asset allocator uh, called Mr. Brown, who actually came up with this idea. And he basically suggested that you should have an equal weighted portfolio, which takes into account stocks, bonds, cash and commodities. And that essentially is in a very crude sense is what a, a cockroach portfolio will be, which would take into account market scenarios, which uh, would be all four quadrants. And when I say four quadrants, really what we are looking at is you can have either an inflation or a deflation. You can have either growth or degrowth in terms of the economy. And therefore, we are looking at saying that all four combinations of uh, inflation, deflation, growth and degrowth, you should be able to have a portfolio which is uh, reasonably stable. A, a reasonably stable portfolio and viewers as... Anand Tandon was helping us understand this. Let me just add, uh, we have seen the last three years, uh, in fact, uh, with the onset of COVID, that uh, unusual events, black swan events, uh, or events that were not at all on the horizon, at least from a markets and investment perspective, have occurred with regular uh, sort of certainty. In fact, the only thing that is now certain is that there could be a surprise uh, at the next bend on the road. 
बट आनंद बिफोर वी गो इन टू द डेप्थ ऑफ वॉट अ कॉक्रोच पोर्टफोलियो इज आई वॉन्ट टू यू टू टेल आर व्यूअर्स वाई इज दिस टर्म इन वोग नाउ बिकॉज आई वॉज रीडिंग अप एंड आई रियलाइज दैट म्यूटनी फंड हैड मेड दिस पब्लिक एंड गॉन विद दिस स्ट्रैटेजी ऑलमोस्ट थ्री ईयर्स अगो and like you said it's been in vogue in the past but in the past as well we have seen for example the 2008 meltdown uh, and after that at regular intervals there have been occasions where investors belief in their existing portfolio has been shaken and shaken to the core why is it in vogue now and is it relevant to the current indian market situation so i think indian market right now is behaving as a bit of an outlier so you know it's not necessarily what the indian market is doing first of all uh, let me explain that this idea of having an all weather portfolio has converted itself into various forms so now for example what started out by saying you know you invest equally in equity debt cash and uh, commodities the commodities for example could now include not just gold which is what originally the plan was but almost any other commodity so you can actually have a range of etfs to take care of commodity allocation you can have a range of etfs which can take care of for example the cash allocation and similarly if the equity allocation can be across a range of indices and so on so it is entirely possible now to have a slightly more complex portfolio but keeping the overall structure in mind remember the key assumption behind making a portfolio of this nature is that you are not trying to determine market direction or market environment if you are in a position to be able to do that maybe this is not the best option because you know obviously if you think that the market is bullish and therefore why would you not want to put more money into equities uh, you know sure that's an option but that means you are making an assumption that the markets are bullish and will continue to remain over your investment horizon this is for a situation where there is strong uh, uncertainty now why is may it may be relevant in today's context is actually if you look at the global situation you know globally uh, i'll just give you some numbers which are fairly startling nobody is focusing on it enough i think the overall gdp of the world today is roughly at 100 trillion dollars the debt has gone up to 300 trillion dollars the developed markets alone that is the us and the japan and europe are 250 trillion dollars so you are looking at a debt to gdp which is unpayable just take the us market alone you have a, a, a market which is about whatever 25 26 trillion dollar gdp 33 trillion dollar debt targeted to go up by their own calculations to above 40 trillion dollars by 2030 your total income is only 4.4 trillion if you were to say that look you know our interest rates which were half a percent a year back is now 5 and a half percent today 5% increase on 33 trillion dollars is a trillion and a half mm -hmm. so you are looking at a situation where it is quite possible that in the near future as they roll out as some of their existing debt expires and new ones have to be rolled forward you will be looking at interest becoming their largest component of the government spend there and therefore it is going to be extremely difficult to assume that you know you will be able to and your def deficit continues to remain very high and this is true not only for the us markets but almost all developed markets across the world so to have a situation where you will be to for you to be able to take away the debt and find some ways of paying it inflation is more or less a given so to mm. my mind you are looking at a situation that it is very possible that even as the mark as the global economies uh, you know kind of slow down inflation is going to persist far longer and therefore there there can be a question mark on how fast the growth of the uh, uh, of the economies is so i'm saying that you know while on the one hand there is a consensus view almost that the interest rates have peaked my view is that you know that is far from a given and therefore you might want to think about finding a way of where you are not making those kind of uh, projections and taking a more balanced and a more spread out market any index or index based investing basically assumes that you find a way to buy whatever is your asset alloc asset uh, class buy as much of it as possible so that you remove unsystematic risk and that's the case behind this portfolio structure also that you remove unsystematic risk by buying across the board uh, across commodities uh, cash and uh, debt and equity okay let's now discuss this all weather uh, or permanent portfolio Uh, or the cockroach portfolio uh, the most common approach anand as you pointed out is 60 40 uh, but we have to remember that stocks do well 
at a time of growth and in fact there is bias, uh, common investor bias that you tend to buy uh, when everything seems to be uh, uh, doing uh, well. And bonds, uh, they do well when inflation is low. So what is the ideal cockroach portfolio and especially for the Indian context, Anand? So, as I said, the idea behind the cockroach portfolio or the all-weather portfolio is to make uh, the basic assumption is that we don't want to make assumptions of where the market is going. Hmm. So, you want to be in the market, you don't want to be out of it. It's just that you don't take a view on whether or not any particular scenario will work. So, it's not a question that, you know, you will only have growth and low inflation or growth and high inflation or there is a recession or there is a stagflation and so on. You're not making those assumptions. What you're saying is you'll go with the market and it doesn't matter where it goes. Hmm. And by and large, if you were to kind of replicate this portfolio, you will find that, of course, it underperforms a pure stock portfolio in bullish markets. Hmm. But it doesn't do so badly overall over a longer enough period of time because there are periods where the equity, where the equity markets don't do very well. And hmm. perhaps bonds do or gold does and so on. Hmm. So if you were to try and replicate it, you will find that the performance on a... a you know, on a, a risk adjusted basis is actually quite competitive compared to a 60 40 portfolio. So you okay. can, for example, just take a, you know, some kind of an all seasons bond fund, you could take some kind of a, a, a equity index fund, you could just take an ETF for a gold or a commodity ETF, and uh, you know, some kind of short term treasury and uh, debt fund, and uh, you could you are pretty much in the game. So you're not taking a view on where the market's headed. And by and large, as I said, on a risk-adjusted basis, this will give you fairly good uh, uh, results even as the markets move. Anand, if, we, if the approach is to sort of take four baskets and put 25-25% each um, uh, in that, uh, stocks, bonds, cash and gold, uh, can this kind of a portfolio last forever? Can you kind of hold it? Uh, forever absolutely I mean, in fact this is probably the only kind of portfolio you can hold forever because as i said since you're not making a prediction you don't have to watch how the road curves it's you know any other kind of portfolio where you're making an asset allocation which is uh you know pre-decided automatically assumes that the road follows a certain path and that path is something that is what you're trying to aim for now, like, as I said, when uh, the situation is clear and, you know, the path looks uh, very, uh, uh, is very clear and high visibility is there for where the market's headed, uh, certainly that kind of asset allocation can improve your returns. So the question really is that, you know, who's this portfolio good for? So if you are someone who's very early in your career or someone who's, uh, you know, earning uh, huge amounts of money and therefore uh, is willing to take the risk because, you know, whatever the, you lose on the portfolio can be made up if the portfolio were to go down. Uh, sure, and all equity portfolio can work as well. Uh, as you grow a little older, maybe you want to, that's where the 60-40 comes in. But to my mind, that 60-40 is not adequate because it still assumes market which is, uh, you know, generally bullish. Okay. So if you really want to avoid taking market risk, as I said, take away the unsystematic risk and only expose yourself to the overall risk of the market, then this is a portfolio which you could have. And as a, and you could actually continue it forever because you know you are not making any assumption about where each one of these asset classes is headed. Uh, making no assumptions, uh, and I don't know if our viewers, some of them might interpret this as kharid ke bhool jao type of uh, advice. But within this construct, uh, the 25% holding of stocks, so if you were uh, going to be asked today to help build such a portfolio for the kind of target investor, uh, those who do not have the capacity for too much risk and want uh, stable returns even, even during times of volatility, what kind of choice as far as the components of the stock part of this portfolio should one make? So again, the best way to play it is to buy the ETFs for the indices. And again, you know, there is a tendency that, to say that, oh, I'll take so much percentage, large cap, mid cap, small cap and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the point, as I have been repeatedly mentioning, is that you do not make these projections, right? So you do not say which kind of cap will do. So an all cap portfolio is probably the best. Mm -hmm. 
uh, an unweighted uh, you know nifty portfolio is probably a good way of doing it if you don't have an option which allows us to do that then just take an equal measure of large mid small cap uh, funds and just leave it there uh, you know and that is the probably the best way of uh, of kind of diversification which is an extreme diversification it will take you along with wherever the market heads anand one of the other questions that people might have is that when it comes to the sort of uh profile of the indian investor gold and traditional gold physical gold has a very strong component even many of those people and we have had millions fresh entrants into the market in the last 3 4 years have very significant holdings of physical gold family gold uh, should that also be counted in this well ideally yes except that by and large the traditional way of holding gold in this country is in the form of jewelry which makes it a little difficult to treat it as a saleable asset class hmm. uh, now to the extent that you are not looking to sell any of the portfolio and you are looking at it as a surplus investment that's fine but by and large you know mentally if you are thinking of something as a consumable in the form of uh, jewelry or something that you can wear and therefore you are unwilling to treat it as something which is just an asset class which you can hold unemotionally mm. uh, then it is better to keep it out but if you are willing to treat it as something which is part of an overall asset portfolio which is useful and can be used when required uh, and you can sell it off then it should be included remember that holding jewelry has a problem that you know there is almost a fifth to a fourth of the value of that is itself making charges etc so it's not it's a little more difficult to value it uh and only cult- and culturally large parts of the country still uh, find it a bit uh, you know difficult to uh, re- remove the emotional attachments and there is a taint associated with selling gold from your house so all those uh, cultural issues are there and uh, therefore i think in terms more of saying that look look at an investment portfolio if you think you are able to uh, trade use your family gold or jewelry as as part of the portfolio absolutely there is no reason why you should not because you should be looking at everything which is uh, uh, which is saleable as part of the portfolio but uh, the uh, you know like your own personal housing if you are staying in a house there is not much point marking it to market you are not going to sell it you are consuming it uh, only when you have got another house which you can move to and therefore are willing to sell this house does it actually become a investment till then it's not really an investment so then that's the same approach i would use for uh, for for uh, jewelry as well in that sense anand would uh, just to take this gold point forward a bit more uh, would it therefore also be okay to raise the point that gold held in the manner in which most indians hold it which is um, traditional jewelry gold acquired at a very low prices maybe 50 years back 60 years back then passed down generation to generation is not actually a hedge against inflation which is the way it is marketed or spoken about in investment circles elsewhere in india because of the peculiar nature of our attachment to gold it really is not a hedge against inflation and there therefore should gold at 25% be the way to look at it to indianize this cockroach portfolio would you suggest that we reduce it even further and maybe increase bonds for example well you know so i can't really answer for the emotional connect right i mean that's an individual uh, characteristic uh, so let's just put it in the form of what would you do with your surplus money if you for example if you as i mentioned you know you could add real estate now would real estate as your own house be real estate or would it be real uh, your own house and therefore not something that you are looking at uh, trading off uh, does it add to your net worth absolutely it does but you know when you are looking at your financial investments typically we don't look at you know your uh, self uh, occupied house as a financial investment though it may be a large part of your savings for most uh, families in india so uh, in the same context i would consider jewelry if you are able to detach yourself from the emotional component and the fact that you have a large part of your jewelry uh, therefore as a available portfolio for uh, utilization when necessary certainly it can be considered as part of the thing and therefore to that extent financial investments in terms of cash need not be up to 25% in gold Okay. just that uh, you know, so these are uh, kind of uh, indicative ranges all you are saying is by and large keep it equally distributed don't take a call on where any one asset class is going yeah. 
no, no. But, uh, if, uh, but the, the, to, to continue with that point, because this is the important part, we, uh, uh, this has to be uh, sort of correlated to the Indian context and I would believe that anything from overseas, even in, uh, in the investment world has to be Indianized. I want to take that real estate component uh, further ahead with you. Unlike developed markets in India, again the nature of our society and how our, uh, where we are at in the de development economic curve. The first house is very important, uh, even a two bedroom house and the rural to urban shift. So therefore, can a, a, let's say a 35 year old uh, person today, I'm just trying to mention it as an example, uh, don't hold me on the specific age uh, uh, mention, also believe that uh, investment in a house is part of this cockroach approach because you need houses, uh, there is housing stock requirement in India and we are seeing in the recent past what is happening to prices also, Anand. I would not recommend that, uh, frankly, because, you know, what do you do when you sell your house, assuming that you do have, you find, you've, you know, taken a loan, got yourself a house, you're staying there. You need a place to stay. I mean, uh, you know, broadly in India, we have a very peculiar situation where the uh, rental yield on houses are very low. So if you were to just look at the uh, numbers, uh, you would argue that, you know, nobody should be owning a house because a 2% rental yield is all you're getting. You might as well rent it. Um, but at the same time, you look at the number of people who own houses and uh, the the, uh, the first opportunity that anyone has is to go buy a house. So it's not really a purely unemotional uh, investment. It is actually a consumable, somehow related to your own life, uh, life support and well-being. And it is almost mandatory for most people to own a house. It, in fact, I would think that only people who have a huge amount of surplus can actually think in terms of saying, I don't need the house because I can stay on rent. Because somehow there is a belief that in case there is a huge volatility, you will be able to actually go out and buy a house whenever you want to. Whereas uh, people who are trying to build it up slowly, brick by brick, as it were, by taking a loan, uh, you know, paying off EMIs and so on, are very unlikely to be able to be unemotional about the fact that they have a house which they can sell off and in cash, unless there is a huge family emergency. So obviously we are looking at uh, uh, portfolios which are beyond the minimum requirement for your own consumption. Uh, these are clearly meant for people who have surplus capital and therefore are able to make investments without the need to uh, quickly withdraw at any point at any near term point of view and can by and large manage a reasonable amount of emergency also without having to dip into this. Uh, so obviously yeah, someone who's building their portfolio first would actually want to first go buy a house before you do anything else. Yes, that's uh, and that's why uh, viewers, uh, we've got gold out of the way because that is an Indian peculiarity. We've also discussed uh, real estate and I personally uh, encounter several situations where people say that, oh, you end up discussing on television the fact that real estate is not that great an investment. Please say on rent, don't own it. But do you know, apna ghar hone ka matlab kya hota? And viewers, uh, this was an attempt to uh, get Anand to give us his views on that. Let's take the third element to this. And the third element is fixed deposits. We still are a nation of fixed deposit holders, Anand. You will agree with me. Now, where do fixed deposits uh, fit into this cockroach portfolio, if at all? So that's the equivalent of cash, right? I mean, this is something that you can uh, take out uh, more or less any time, though you lose some money on that. By and large, I would still think you are better off, uh, you know, buying some uh, short-end mutual fund uh, because it's far more liquid and there is no loss when you are actually selling. Now that there, there is no great advantage on the tax, it doesn't mean that it has become disadvantaged. So yes, it is now equal to a fixed deposit in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, being able to hold on to uh, cash but uh, it is still a lot more liquid and it still tends to move at least with uh, uh, with rates as they move so fixed deposit to some extent can be equated to a term portfolio uh, whereas you know the cash part would be actually in money market short term bonds and that kind of things mm -hmm. uh, whereas the debt part would be debt which would be slightly longer dated perhaps uh, so you are looking for, and in debt, you could actually include things like REITs and so on. So basically, debt represents everything which is a higher yield, longer duration kind of portfolio. Whereas cash, we are talking about short duration, no uh, interest rate risk, and pretty much just, uh, you know, a really short term interest rates, if you were. So the equivalent would be a, a money market fund or a, a, or a, a very short term fund with a duration of less than a year. 
So as we uh, uh, wind down our conversation, viewers, one of the things that uh, comes to mind is that most investors would like the returns of uh, the fastest uh, growing stocks, but they would like these returns uh, with minimal uh, risk, with FD-like risk. Anand, the kind of portfolio that we have discussed and if someone were to follow your advice and uh, tick off all the boxes that are necessary, what kind of returns can one expect or target or be prepared for with this kind of investment approach? So, as I mentioned, you know, there obviously in any scenario where there is a very strong uh, move in the market in a one asset class, with perfect hindsight, we could have, we can always do very well. But, uh, you know, if you were to do a simulation of this portfolio and, you know, since we now have ETFs, etc., you can go back and do 10, 20 year simulation fairly easy, easily. You will find that on a risk adjusted basis, this doesn't do badly at all. Uh, it does reasonably well. And in fact, while, you know, on a, a YOY basis, obviously, it will be lower than an equivalent 60-40 portfolio, for example, wherever the asset classes have performed well. But on when if you were to take a sharp ratio, for example, you would probably find that it is actually better than uh, almost any other kind of ratioed portfolio between various asset classes. Okay, uh, Anand Tandon, um, uh, we've discussed on today's show uh, from the basics like why do we invest and to questions like how do we protect what we have uh, for our wealth and for our family's future. But like you said, uh, the term cockroach may sound repulsive, may not be very agreeable and definitely not very fancy, but it might be the best way to have stable returns through different times including extremely volatile times. And as the recent correction in the Indian market has taught us, the best thing that investment strategy requires is patience and patience with the belief that uh, offense may win games, but defense always wins championships. Anantanan, thank you very much for your time with us today on the show. With that, it's a wrap on this episode. We'll be back with more. Until then, goodbye.